So nice to see you again. Looking forward to bring to share with you this message. I actually presented it in Indonesia, in Indonesian, and it was the first time I presented this uh, message in Indonesia. And I wanted to do it in English so much because I know very many people would benefit from it if it were to be given in English. And the title of the message it will be a three days message so today uh, Wednesday Thursday and then Friday it's going to be a threefold uh, message and the title is going to be about seven day Adventist and I think it's very important to understand why there is a seven day Adventist because there are so many who profess to be seven day Adventist yet know not exactly why they are Seventh-day Adventists. And before I studied the Word of God, that was pretty much me. I have no clue what Seventh-day Adventists, other than the fact that I go to church on the Seventh-day Sabbath. But beside that, there's really no explanation why. And we know that Spirit of Prophecy mentioned that God's people in the last days will be no different than the world. And the only difference right now I can see, the majority of the uh, churches are just the days of worship. Everything else is even worse than the world. The world is more into studying the Word of God. In Indonesia, there are non adventists who are inquiring about the present truth message, who are actually rebuking the Adventists who's making fun of it. <laughs> So there are Adventists who's talking bad about present truth and the non-Adventists actually heard and said, you know what, I heard the message already and I look it up and everything is right. Nothing is uh, out of context. And I don't know why you rejected it because I love it so much. And these are non-Adventists who are rebuking the Adventists. So I see, as the Spirit of Prophecy already said, that you are even worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. If the message were to be given to Sodom and Gomorrah that was given to you, they would remain today. And I see the fulfillment is getting worse and worse. Getting worse and worse. They just had a meeting in Indonesia. Uh, all the uh, pastors, I don't know Eastern or Western Union, but the pastors were invited to a, a little town somewhere south of Celebes there or in the celibus south of the Philippines there. And one of the topics they discussed was basically they informed the ministers, the pastors, to not mention anything negative about the Pope. Mm -hmm. And it is command from the higher power to prohibit them to say anything bad about the Pope. Mm -hmm. So that's been prophesied already and we see the fulfillment. The only prophecy that I'm waiting that is yet to be uh, fulfilled in its fullness is when they will eventually from the pulpit urge the members the necessity of keeping the first day of the week. Mm -hmm. That's just uh, a matter of time because if you are basically making friends with the Antichrist who is Sunday keeping, you eventually will advocate his day. And that's just uh, the fulfillment that we're waiting for. So I just want to remind all of us that only a few will make out alive and well out of the many that God has already chosen to become Seventh-day Adventists and that's what we're going to study. So what is Adventism and why did God raise Seventh-day Adventists? Okay. So we're going to begin because we have I think 115 or 16 slides tonight. Tomorrow is going to be 146. So and the next day 130 so we're gonna be in for a long haul so we just better get started I guess okay seven day this let's begin with the first angels message Revelation 14 6 and 7 and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel and this is the first angels message right and to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. Why? Here's the question. Why? 
because or for the hour of judgment is come. So that means the first thing in this message is preparing the inhabitants of the world for the hour of judgment. And we know this happens before 1844. So the first angel's message arrived into the scene in 1798 when William Miller began to study. It was beginning to, he began to preach the first angel's message and then it was empowered in 1840. And then the second angel's message uh, arrived. So this is before 1844. So there is going to be judgment and the inhabitants of the world are to fear God, give glory because of their judgment. And then worship the creator. Right? And we know worship has everything to do with the creator. And creator is a sign of, the sign of a creator is Sabbath. So, and so we have a message that's given before 1844 and it's going to bring out the Sabbath day. Right? So this is kind of setting up for Seventh day Adventist right here. Okay. Okay, let's take a look at the Hour of Judgment. We're going to look a little bit about the Hour of Judgment. We'll go back to Daniel 7, verse 9 and 10. And I beheld the thrones were cast down. By the way, if there's any questions or anything, yeah, free, please feel free because, you know, I don't want it to be a one way. Just as long as we're in the context because uh, we have it recording. So usually when you have questions, the people who are watching on video would probably have the same question and you would probably ask their question as long as we remain in the same uh, topic it will be okay and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool his throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire a fiery stream so you can see there's fire 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 we want to talk about the fire later at the close of this study a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand, thousands ministers unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And the judgment was set, the books were open. So when we go back to Revelation 14, for the hour of judgment is come, and the books are open. I'm just combining two texts. The books are beginning to open. Okay, let's talk. Let's look at the books that are being opened. Revelation 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. Here we have plural. So at least two books. And another book was open, singular, only one book. So, so at least there are three books. Which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the, those things which are written in the books, which are the plural. Mm -hmm. That means we are being judged based on what is written on the books. Right? And we know the book of life is written our name. And the books are written all our deeds. And we are judged according to our deeds. According to their works. Okay? So this is all happening in the day of judgment. Great Controversy 480. The books of record in heaven in which the names and the deeds of men are registered are to determine the decisions of the judgment. That means decision is going to be made based on what is written. That means every act that we commit is going to be judged and is going to be immortalized in that book. The book of life, that's the other book, contains the names of all who have ever entered the service of God. A book of remembrance is written before God in which are recorded the good deeds of them that fear the Lord and that thought, of, thought upon His name. Malachi 3.16 The words of faith, the acts of love are registered in heaven. That's the book of remembrance. So there are two books. One is the book of iniquity. One is the book of remembrance. Remembrance, everything that you want God to remember. The book of iniquity, hopefully everything has been erased already. So that's open in the day of judgment. And that judgment was already preceded by the warning given by angel number one, which is fear God, give glory for our judgment. 
because your book is going to be open right and your destiny will be determined on what is already written in the book right? in the book book of god's remembrance every deed of righteousness is immortalized every there every temptation resisted every evil overcome every word of tender pity express is faithfully chronicle and every act of sacrifice every suffering and sorrow endured for christ's sake is recorded this is a record also of the sins of man that's the one we don't want so the good deeds and the sins in the books of record here's the sins every idle word that men shall speak we have in the Indonesian uh, uh, Indonesian language we call it asbun asbun is a combination of two words made short which means asal bunyi so we mix it asbun asal bunyi asal bunyi means as long as it make noise I don't care what the value of that noise is as long as it make noise in other words, asbun means people talk, but it doesn't get you anywhere. And that's exactly what idle words is, because when you start the car engine on, and you're not going anywhere, it's idling, but it doesn't get you anywhere. So any word that does not help people to get, to edify them in spirituality, it's idle words. And it says, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Why do you say that? Or why do you not say that? Man, that means everything. So sometimes it's better just not to say anything. But there are times that you are to say something to help that person and then you remain silent. So we're accountable in every little thing. That's the judgment. The secret purposes and the motives appear in the unerring register. For God will bring the light to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. Even though it's in the secret chambers of my heart, it may sound good, but the motive is bad, that's also being judged. So the question is, when God opened my book, do I want him to open my book tonight? That's the question. <laughs> Lord, please don't open my book yet. And he says, when then? When? Well, that's why if he opened our books at night, I don't know what, you know. Well, it's not I don't know. I pretty much know already. Pretty much know. So that's why Sister White says, pray that the Sunday you know will not come soon. Because if it does come, you're not ready. Pray that your judgment is not tonight. Because, But if we pray, Lord, please delay my judgment. question is, what are you doing to prepare for it? And that's judgment. Every man's works, work passes in review before God and is registered for faithfulness or unfaithfulness. And the word every. You know, God does not miss anything, right? So every means every. Every. Opposite each name in the books of heaven is entered with terrible exactness. Every wrong word every selfish act every unfulfilled duty and every secret sin with every artful dissembling heaven sent warning of reproofs neglected wasted moments unimproved opportunities the influence exerted for good or for evil with its far-reaching result let me just make comment with its far-reaching result Let's say I took a pebble and I throw it right into in the middle of like a pond. Well, my responsibility is to create the first wave. That's my responsibility. But does it stop there? You it's got the rippling ripple. effect. So my sin is not the first ripple, but the last unto the last ripple. So I may have died already, but how about the rippling effect after I die? That will be judged in the day of judgment. Mm. Mm -hmm. So it's called the sin of the fathers. 
physical change. Yeah. Right? Not that the sin is transferred, yeah. but the influence. Yeah. The influence. So I'm already, so somebody said, he's dead, okay. His books are already closed. Not yet, because the ripple effect may still be, you know, in movement, still active. And then the question is, when will it die out? It could be generation after generation could be influenced. Mm -hmm. And that will be all uh, countable in the Day of Judgment. With its far-reaching results, all are chronicled by the recording angel. Ooh. That means who's going to be prepared? Science of the Times, June 2, 1890. The judgment of the dead has been going on, and soon the judgment will begin upon the living. And every case will be decided. I think the word that I read so many times is every. Every, every. How about this one? Every. How about that one? Every. How about that one I didn't say? Every. It will be known whose names are retained upon the books of life and whose are blotted out from the book of life. Every day the angels of God keep a record of the transactions of men. And these records stand open to the eyes of angels, to the eyes of Christ, and the eyes of God. Those who have manifested true repent, that's the only key. Man, that's the only key. Because if I look at my records, and say, how am I ever going to go to heaven with this? And he says, the only way is if you have true repentance. That's the only eraser that God accepts, true repentance. For sin. And by living faith, I'm glad Miss White added this because repent, repent, but no living faith in Christ are obedient to God's command. That means I forgive your sin, go and sin no more. That's what it means. We'll have their names retained in the book of life. I think that word right there is so important. Repentance. And they will be confessed before the Father and before the holy angels. Jesus will, Jesus will say, they are mine. I purchased them with my own blood. That's the key, repentance. That's the key. That means we need to brush up on what repentance is. It's not the repentance of Judas, not the repentance of Saul, it has to be the repentance of David, Psalm 51. That's repentance, right? <clears throat> okay. When any have sins remaining upon the books of record, unrepented of and unforgiven their names will be blotted out of the book of life and the record of their good deeds will be erased from the book of God's remembrance if all the record of my good deeds are erased what do I have left all my sins and we know in Ezekiel 18 and Matthew 18 story of the debtor remember that he was he was his master forgave him of thousand whatever and then he owed 100 pence and then he says everything will be given back to you even though he was already forgiven that means he's gonna bring back to our account everything that God has forgiven that's that's the doctrine of an unforgiven if God already forgave my sin how come he waited until the day of atonement before he erased it because if you commit sin again, everything is going to be returned to you. And that's the doctrine that many have already rejected. Because when I share this in the churches, they said, What? Randy is bringing something, something weird that we have never heard. And yet, that's Adventism. Because God does not blot out the moment, the, the moment he forgives sin. That's the understanding of sanctuary. You have the holy place, that's forgiveness. And then the most holy place, that's blotting out your sins that has been forgiven. Mm -hmm. Because if you commit it again and did not repent, everything will be given back to you. That's the physical like the of there. Yeah. That's why yeah. they put it on the on the on the, on the, the, bail, the bail. Right? That's yeah. right. The sin is still there. <laughs> Even though they're forgiven. And if you share that, they think you're crazy. Like, oh, this is bringing off-seasonal teaching, and yet that's... The stain's still there. That's right. 
Yeah. That's why so it, it's very important to understand time theory. Yeah. Yeah. It's really important. Yeah. Yeah. Pa the past is past, mm -hmm. but the present is there. So the only blood, the only sins that will be blotted out in the Day of Atonement are the sins that have been forgiven and remain forgiven. Because mm -hmm. you could say, and remember Paul says, to be repented of, not to be repented of. So you don't repent and then I repent because I repent. And you know what, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have repented. No, a repentance that you are not going to be regretful of. That's why we have the atonement. Do you still, are you still in the same condition when you repented? Yes, I still hate sin. But, well, you know, not, not really. Oh, that's different. That's why he says, I forgive you, but he says, go and sin. That's the key. That's sanctuary language. Yes. Anyway, that's just something about sanctuary. Okay, now sense. let's talk about, yeah, uh, cleansing of sanctuary. Maybe we can open some text later on. You know, probably later after this, we can open some text and read about that. The cleansing of the sanctuary, which is uh, the day of uh, judgment. Daniel 8, 14. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That means the sanctuary is, be, is cleansed at the end of 2,300 2, days or years. Is equal for six. One day equals one year. Okay. Now, what's this got to do with Adventism? Southern Watchmen. Searching the scriptures for further light, and comparing this prophetic period with the records of historians, that's our second witness. First witness the Bible, second witness is history. They learned that the 2300 days extended to year 1844. And we already know that, but I still have to put it there just to make sure that we have it in writing. So the cleansing of the sanctuary begins in 1844. Okay. okay. Manuscript release, the Savior did enter the most holy place in 1844 to cleanse the sanctuary and the investigative judgment had commenced for the dead and then close with the living, right? So 1844, God begins to open the records of the first one that had ever lived. So it was Adam's book that was first opened, he was dead. And then when he finished the dead, he's going to commence with the living gonna be finished. Okay. <clears throat> now, Testimony Volume 8, 116. In the Advent movement, he has wrought for his heritage, even as he had wrought for the Israelites in leading them from Egypt. So Mrs. White is making a comparison between the Advent movement and the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. One coming out of Egypt, one coming out of Rome, both going to the promised land. One earthly promised land, one heavenly promised land. So we have two lines. And we know when we study Isaiah 28, line upon line, right? We have two lines. So the Advent movement, just like the Israelite, children of Israelite movement, in the great disappointment of 1844, so now Ms. White make connection between the Advent movement and connected with the year 1844, the faith of his people was tested as was that of the Hebrews at the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. So we can see the history of the ancient of Israel is simply being repeated in the Advent movement. And what year was that? 1844, right? Okay, the question. Why did God raise the Advent movement in 1844? Well, for the same reason why he raised the children of Israel out of Egypt. So, did he intend to raise two movements? No. Why did he raise the other movement? Because the children of Israel failed. That's why. If the children of Israel did not fail, there is no need for the movement. So, the children of Israel failed. That's why he raised the other movement in 1844. Right? So, why did he raise the other movement other than the fact that the children of Israel failed? It has to do with the beginning of the investigative judgment, right? 1844. Because he began to raise them, 1844. 
and that happens to be the beginning of their investigative judgment. So that means our existence has something to do with judgment, mm -hmm. investigative judgment, right? It's not a coincidence. That means should we know something about investigative judgment as Advent movement? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We were raised for this. The beginning of the blotting out of sins. Should we know about that also? Yes. God raised the Advent movement and it was the beginning of the making up of the subjects of the kingdom of heaven. Because God says the only ones who will enter heaven are the ones whose sins have been blotted out. And the fact that he raised Adventism in the beginning of the process of blotting out of sin, that means he raised Adventism to be an example of people whose sins have been blotted out in the day of judgment. So, should Adventists believe that their shin, sins be blotted out? <laughs> Speaking about, you know what, let's go there. Let's go to Ezekiel 18. Let's go to Ezekiel 18. Because that kept coming up in the head, so might as well go there. Let's go to Ezekiel 18. 18? 18. 1-8, yeah. Ezekiel is 18. Okay, let's start with 20. I'm going to read Ezekiel 18, verse 20. <clears throat> the soul that sinneth, it shall die. What Ezekiel is saying, if you sin, you die. It doesn't say, if you sin, your children die. No, it doesn't say that. If you sin, you die. Okay. And then, give the definition. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. That means you are responsible for your own sin. I cannot transfer you my sin. Okay? And then, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So you're, responsible. you're responsible. Yes. But if the wicked, here it is, but if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my be righteous you have to repent what does it take to repent see the exceeding sinfulness of sin what does it what does it take to see the exceeding sinfulness of sin you gotta see the love of God where do you see the love of God a cross so that means you have to go through all that to be made righteous and then you repent and then God placed his son's righteousness on my behalf and then he sees you're righteous and your sins are forgiven that all that process right that means have you have the experience of hatred for sin yes because repentance is godly sorrow for sin so you already hate sin i don't want to do that again and then he says right here but when the righteous turn away from his righteousness that means he said you know what i'm gonna love sin again even though i see how terrible it was even though i see how it pained christ to suffer my sin i'm gonna do it again so it, just declare righteous is it's easy to be righteous is to be in a state of righteousness just to declare somebody righteous judicially doesn't make that person righteous it is an experience of being righteous and to be experiencing that you have to go through repentance hatred love all that stuff but if he turn away from that right and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abomination that the wicked man doeth shall he live Let's read here. If you are righteous, that means all your righteousness are forgiven, right? Mm -hmm. Remember this. If you are righteous, all your right unrighteousness have been forgiven. Now, what does he say? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned mm -hmm. in his trespasses that he hath trespassed and in his sin that he hath sinned, that he hath sinned in them he shall he die. God. Forfeited. Gone. Now what happened to all the sins that have been forgiven? Right? How about all the sins that had already been forgiven? Now let's go to Matthew 18. It's easy to remember. Ezekiel 18 and Matthew 18. Just remember that. Let's go to Matthew 18. What happened to all the sins that have already been forgiven? Matthew 18. 
and if you want to make it easier in Ezekiel Ezekiel 18 you can start at 18 18 18 it's easier to remember 18 18 and then Matthew 18 yeah <clears throat> Verse 23, Matthew 18, 23. So the question is, what happened to all the sins that God had already forgiven, right? Therefore, I was made righteous. He was already forgiven. That's 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which, had take, would, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. And that's a lot of money. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and his children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. You gotta pay. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Just remember those words, because that's gonna be repeated, just like a recorder being played again. Exact words. Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion. It doesn't say, then the Lord realized that this man deserved to be forgiven. It doesn't say that. Compassion is something nobody deserves. With mercy. And lose him and forgave him the debt. 10,000. Gone. Zero. Wow. That's how powerful compassion is. Wow. But the same servant went out and found out one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, which is probably one penny. Man, and he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, "Pay me that thou owest." One penny. <laughs> and his fellow servant fell down at his feet and let's play the recorder again. Have patience with me; I will pay thee all. That's the recorder right there. Exact words. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. One hundred pence. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. And his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all thy debt. Remember, I forgave you 100%. Forgiven already. Okay, you can't touch my sin anymore. You've forgiven him already. I forgive you all their debt. Because thou desire. Not because you deserve it. Because you desire. So I have compassion. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on you, be merciful even as your father is merciful. And his Lord was wrath, here it is, and deliver unto the torments, let's read the last one, oh. till he paid all oh, that was due. How much was it returned? 100%. That's the day of judgment. That's Adventism 101 right there. That's why we have the Day of Atonement, because all the sins that has been forgiven is not blotted out yet. Why? Because it could be returned to you if you change your mind. Until the Day of Atonement. Then you're free. That's the doctrine of Adventism. That's the doctrine of Adventism. 100%. That's why we believe from the courtyard to the holy and then there was a holy. That's the process. First, you have to have God is heart. You see the cross, God is heart. And then you give it to God. And then you get the bread. And then you have the oil to become light of all. And then your sins will be this, will be received by the Father. That's the three, right? And then you face the Father face to face. And then he says, I forgive you. Not because you deserve it, because I have mercy, mercy seat. So when is our day of atonement? Nobody knows. <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> We just have so to pray, it's, Lord. It's an individual. It's an individual. Yeah. Even, Sister Y says, even Satan never knows. Hmm. See, even Satan never knows. Hmm. Only, we know, only God knows. Even Satan doesn't know. So when Satan, when Satan tempts us in the day of trouble, when he's tempted us, then he realizes, oh, I think God already erased their sin. Then he realizes, they have been sealed already. Even Satan doesn't know. Yeah. If Satan doesn't know, we don't know either. Yeah. That means we gotta be ready any day. Yeah. Any day. How about if I how about if we were to die tomorrow? Yeah. Man. Yeah. Just 
thought of the rippling effect. I would divide that in mind. My books could still be open because I'm still, I still have some things recorded based on the ripple effect. So the question is this, the, here's the key, because I think this is very important. I don't wanna leave it hanging like this as if it's a scary thing. Let's go to John 15. We're studying here, so let's go to John 15. Because I have to give some hope before we go to sleep tonight. Because <laughs> if that, oh, I don't wanna sleep. What if I don't wake up? Oh man. <laughs> Let's go to John 15. There has to be some hope to this. You should be going to sleep with confidence. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> John 15 verse seven. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you. This is the vine and branches, right? Mm -hmm. So how do I abide in God? Through his words. Mm -hmm. His word. So usually we study about vine and branches. But that's good illustration. But in reality, how do I abide in him? It's through his word. And how do I abide in his word? Okay? Let's go to Revelation 320. Revelation 320. How does God abide in me? Through his word. Okay? How does your word abide in me? Revelation 320. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Mm -hmm. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come and up with him and him with me. That means how does his word abide in me? I have to allow it to enter. Because he's knocking, right? He's knocking. He's knocking. Mm -hmm. So how does the word of God enter now? But first I have to what? Hear. Okay? We'll go to here later. Let's go to John 6. Let's go to John 6. How do I allow the word of God to enter? And then we'll figure out when do I hear his voice to allow him to enter. John 6. Let's go with 53. John 6, 53. This is very important text for us before to go, we go to sleep. Okay, 53. Then Jesus said unto me, Very verily I say unto you, except, except ye eat the flesh of Son of Man and drink the blood, ye have no life. So in order for the word of God to enter, I have to what? Eat. And Matthew 4, 4 says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. How do I do get the word of God? <coughs> study. 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 That's how. The, but how do I spit it out? How do I spit back out the word of God? I mean, dude, I don't like doing that. How do I spit it out? Or how do I allow it to stay in me? It is through obedience that the word of God remains. Mm -hmm. So if I eat and then I don't obey, it's like spitting the word of God out again. Mm -hmm. In my shallow understanding before, uh, <coughs> understanding this, that I have to keep on communion. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> continue to, continue to, to oh, attend yeah, the yeah. communion. Yeah. You know, to yeah, 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 that's right. And some people also like that. That's true. And yet so you can do it at home. Just read the word of God. Yeah. yeah. So if you obey, mm -hmm. that's how you retain the word of God. It is through obedience. Yeah. Okay. That's so right. you must eat. Remember, if you don't eat, you have, here's the key, no life. No life. Now let's continue to read. Okay. You have no life. Uh, where did I skip there? One more comment. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's why that's a uh, Catholics, they oh. go for communion all the time. Yeah, I think that's the way they understand this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take it literally, huh? Every every Sunday, we all have communion all the time. So you have to. Oh my! Get the flesh. Literal understanding. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll answer that uh, in John six. We'll answer that. Let's go fifty four. Whoso, whoso eateth my flesh and drink my blood. What does he say? Whoso eat and drink. Oh, what's the next word? Yeah, is that? Okay, and then it says what? Is, is half, past, present, or future? Do I have it now? Half, do I have it now? 
whosoever yeah. does what you have it. Whoso. Ever if you eat? do it, then you have it. So if I eat and drink, yes. do I have life now? Which is life eternal. Now. Yes. This half. Yes. So do I have eternal life presently? So before I go to bed, if I have the word of God dwelling in me and I die, will I be saved? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. But in obedience to that word. Yes. As long as I obey everything I know, I don't care if it's only three things. Mm -hmm. But if I obey, I may die and I be resurrected. And the man who know nine, but only practice eight, does not have life. So it's not how many I know, it's do I obey everything. Mm -hmm. It says, if you eat and drink, you have eternal life. And then it says, and I will raise you in the last days. What does that mean? You may die, but you have eternal life, mm -hmm. even your death. That means I have to continue to study and be fortified with the word of God and continue to obey whatever I know. But say, how come, you know, how come, how come? Well, at least I'm living up to all my light. Because I cannot compare with other people who have so much light and yet maybe they only live half of it. As long as I live all my light. And if I live my light, he will increase it more. But he will only increase. Yeah. 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 To me, being an Adventist is reading the Bible, plus I follow the Ten Commandments, yeah. and I'm within the bounds of that, and I go to church every Sabbath, yeah. and I do what I feel is right, you know, I serve at the soup kitchen, I, I give uh, the boxes to yeah. the needy people, and that kind of thing. I, I, I think I thought I was okay, you yeah. know, and uh, that's basically how they mm -hmm. understand the others that we're inviting and they thank us that you know we're talking to them and we are the ones that are getting out of bound. Mm -hmm. We are there is the boundary of seven day Adventism. We're supposed to be within that but because we're learning all of this yeah. and they think it's a new thing. And we're getting out of the boundary that was set. Yeah. You know, that's how my <laughs> thinking was before. Yeah. yeah, that's true. And they're thinking that uh, we're giving, getting another commitment to another ideology that is not what it's supposed to be. Yep. You know? That's true. Because it's in a Matthew 7. Understanding. That, that's true. Matt, Matthew 27 says, Have I not prophesied in your name, cast out devils in your name, mm -hmm. and done many wonderful works mm -hmm. in your name? And he say, I never knew you. You who work of iniquity. That means we're still committing sin. Right? So, as long as... Let, let's go to uh, 63. Verse 63. And this is commenting on communion on every Sunday. 63 and uh, Jesus said it is the spirit that give life quickeneth because you shall have life right it is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh or the bread profiteth nothing what is it it is the word that I speak unto you they are spirit they are what is it the word not the bread it's the word you can eat all the bread you want, but if you reject the word, then it's nothing. Every week. <laughs> Every week it doesn't matter. Ooh. That's most important. Now, it says, if any man hear the voice of God, right? That means you first have to hear. Because if you don't hear, are you going to open? Now, let's go to Romans ten seventeen. You have to hear first. If you don't hear, what is hearing? Open the ears. Romans ten seventeen. Romans 10, 17. This is about hearing. Remember, I have to hear the word of God in order for me to eat the word of God. Because if I close my ears, I don't hear anybody talking. <laughs> and how am I going to eat the word of God if I don't ever hear the word of God? Okay? 17. So faith comes by hearing. 
Hearing what? Hearing by the... Oh, that means I have to have the ear of faith. So how does my faith increase? As I hear the word of God, let, let's go to Isaiah 30 verse 21. Isaiah 30 verse 21. Remember, hearing the word of God, Isaiah 30 verse 21. We're just going out of bounds here a little bit. But I think it's very important to have this principle and really apply it and have it as our assurance every night before we go to bed. 21, Isaiah 30 verse 21. 30 verse 21. Yeah, 30, 21. 3, 0, 2, 1. Yep. So here, right? Here. Thine ear shall hear a word behind thee saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, whether to right or to right, left. So God gave instruction. Mm -hmm. So his word doesn't come void. His words come in and he gives instruction. This is the way, obey. Mm -hmm. If I obey, he continue to instruct me in the path of the just, which is as a shining light that shines more and more, right? But if I disobey, so as long as I obey everything I know, I have the confidence going to bed. If God decide to put me to rest, I have eternal life. Uh, isn't that something that we have to have confidence before going to bed every night? Mm -hmm. Man, uh, there's a present truth of a family member, actually the husband of the present truth who regularly attend. He attends, but not so connected. Just uh, one day he just died heart attack, just like that. And I was thinking, man, you know, you don't know. You don't know, of course, you can prevent that by living a healthy life, all this stuff, but you don't know, accident, whatever, you know. And then if a person died, that's it. His chance of salvation ends right there. And whatever he has in his hands is dealt to him, that's it. So I have to have the confidence that before I go to bed, I know that I am, God is abiding in me through his word that I obey. And if not, I have to repent and clear everything before I go to bed. That's living not presumptuously. But if I go to bed not thinking about that, I am living presumptuously, mm -hmm. assuming that I will be awakened tomorrow. Oh, that's scary stuff. And when I wake up, whoo, thank goodness. Man, thank God. No, but, oh, I'm up. I'm, I'm, I'm and yet, it was by God's mercy, he said, I still need another you to work. To oh, man, and you, think you deserve it? another day to sin. <laughs> Ooh, every another day is a another, gift. Another, another chance. Another chance. Another chance. Yeah, another chance. Another chance. Oh, if we would just appreciate that, I think, you know, yeah. I think God would appreciate more our life. <laughs> so anyway, that's in the day of judgment. That's the experience that we must have in the day of judgment. So we'll go back here. Why did God raise the Advent movement? It has something about judgment, something about blotting out sin, something about raising a people who will know these things and become, become people who will demonstrate to the world of these subjects. Mm -hmm. That's why you raised Sunday Advent to them. Exactly in the day of judgment. Okay, let's begin with Satan's accusation. Satan declared that it was impossible for the sons and daughters of Adam, which is you and me, to keep the law of God. Or, rephrase that, it is impossible for you and me to stop sin. That's what Satan said. And we know Satan is a liar. There's no truth in him. That means we know this is wrong. Mm -hmm. But, even though we know this is wrong, basically, we're giving the thumbs up to Satan by our life. Mm -hmm. And you know it's wrong. Because we know there's no light in, in Satan. So Satan says, I and you and I cannot stop sinning. And thus charge upon God a lack of wisdom and love. Mm -hmm. So who's being charged? God, not you, not me. God is the one at fault. If we cannot keep the law, there was a fault in the lawgiver. Mm -hmm. And this is the scary part. Men who are under the control of Satan repeat this accusation against God in asserting that, yeah, we cannot stop sinning. That means those who said we cannot stop sinning is basically under the control of them. 
that's that. scary. <laughs> that's really scary. Hmm. Realizing now. Yeah. Impossible to stop. It's, yeah, it's under control of saving. At least I could say, you know what, I'm still struggling, but I yeah. want to help them. It's better to say that. I'm yeah, struggling. I'm, struggling. I, I'm still struggling. Yeah. I'll get there. <laughs> but to say that they cannot you cannot tell. Of God, it's that's like, uh, that's under control of Satan. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's Satan's accusation. Satan said, we cannot stop sin. Okay. So who's being challenged here? God. Jesus. So that means God has to come up with an answer, right? Mm -hmm. It's not us. We cannot come up with an answer. God has to come up with an answer. That means by this quotation, God will have people through whom he will answer Satan's challenges. That's it. That's what it is. Okay. The law of God is the expression of his character. God possesses absolute, invariable, and immutable independence. And his law is without variableness, unalterable, eternal, because the law is the transcript of his character. That means Satan says God's law or God's character needs to be changed because it can recap. So Satan saying God has a character problem, he needs to change his character. And God says, No, I don't want to change I don't I, I don't change my character. But in order for God to have the right to say, I don't change my character, he has to, to produce the people through whom he will answer Satan's challenges. It is. Okay, now, the challenge. Who's being challenged? Romans 3 verse 4. God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy saying, Midas overcome when you are judged. Who's judged? God. So God is being judged by the whole universe. And the whole universe is waiting for his answer in the people to whom he will answer Satan's charges. That's why God has not come yet, because he has yet to produce the answer. No answer? No second coming. No end of controversy. Okay, that's the one we want to do. God's answer to Satan's accusation. That's the one we want. God's answer to Satan's accusation. Daniel 8, 13 and 14. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long yeah. shall be the vision concerning daily and transgression desolation? to trodden underfoot the sanctuary and the host. In other words, how long is God's people going to defile the temple of God? How long is God's people going to stop sinning? That's the question. Or how long or how much longer will God come up with his answer? That's Daniel 8, 13, 14. How much longer, Lord, are you going to shut Satan up forever from his accusation. That's Daniel 18, 8, 13, 14. How much longer, Lord? How much longer? And we know the answer. God says, just wait until the end of 2300 days, then I will produce my answer. Ah, wait a minute. Who did God raise in 1844? <laughs> Who was supposed to answer Satan's charges? Seventh-day Adventists. Are they answering? Or are they answering Satan's charges? By helping Satan win the controversy. Mm -hmm. So God raised Seventh-day Adventists to answer Satan's charges. That man can stop sin. That's why there is Seventh-day Adventists. So yes, why are you Seventh-day Adventists? Oh, because I want to go to heaven. That's not why you're raised. <laughs> I want to go to heaven. See, even Satan wants to go to heaven. <laughs> why are you seven day Adventist? Well, because I keep the Sabbath day and, you know, even not, and my parents won't like it. That's why you're seven day Adventist. No wonder Christ has never come. <laughs> why are you seven day Adventist? Because God raised me up 
to answer Satan to tell the universe that he is a liar. That's why God raised seven animals. Have we forgotten why we were raised? Oof. Forget forgotten. They don't even know the word forgot. They don't even know. They don't even know. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we were raised. To let's see the accuser cast down. Let's see the accuser cast down. Revelation 12 10. Now I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation. That's the cross. 80 31. And strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the Satan, right? Accuser. Accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Wait a minute. That means Satan accusation was already answered at the cross. Because it says the salvation, that's the cross. The accuser was cast down. Mm -hmm. That's the cross. So AD 31, God already has an answer. Okay, let's continue to study. Romans 8, 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in likeness of sinful flesh or human nature, mm -hmm. and for sin, condemn sin in his human nature. So, did God come as God or did he come and overcome as you and me? And isn't that the challenge made by Satan that human flesh cannot keep God's law? Well, Jesus did it. Was Jesus the descendants of Adam and Eve? In flesh? Yes, so Jesus did it. There's the answer. So, if Jesus did it and it satisfies Satan, how come we're still here? Right? How come we're still here? Jesus already answered, unless he came as God to come yeah. to this world to prove what God can do, which he doesn't have to come yeah. to show us. Because if he's he came as God, he doesn't have to come. We know <laughs> what he can do. So Christ came as man, and as a descendant of Adam and Eve, he, his right arm had his right arm. RC right mm -hmm. arm had gotten him the victory, and we know the right arm represents the medical missionary. Mm -hmm. His right arm had gotten him the victory. As a conqueror, he planted his banner on the eternal heights. Was there not joy among the angels? All heaven triumphed in the Savior's victory. Satan was defeated and he knew that his kingdom was lost. That's the cross. Was Satan defeated? Yep. Well, what's the purpose of 1844 when that accusation was clearly answered in 8031? Could one sin have been found in Christ had he in one particular yielded to Satan in order to escape the terrible torture, the enemy of God and man would have triumphed. Christ bowed his head and died, but he held fast his faith in God. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down. So that was the cross. Satan's accusation was answered at the cross. Now, let's go back to Genesis 3.15. Why the need for Advent movement then? And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it, or and the enmity, shall bruise thy head, serpent, Satan, and you, Satan, shall bruise the enmity's heel. So where is Satan going to be successful? Here. Bottom here. Right at the bottom. So he's going to bruise the heel. Right? Okay. Here's the answer right here already. Let's, let's continue to find out. How come we're still here? Okay. Jesus already conquered Satan. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his heel. Right? Feet. <clears throat> That means to conquer Satan, Satan has to be conquered under his feet or heel. And when he does that, he bruised the heel. Right? 
for he had put all things under his feet. But when he said all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expect, ex, accepted, which did put all things under him. That means for him to have total victory, everything has to be under his feet. That means the cross was not everything under the feet. We're gonna, we're gonna prove that. The cross, not everything under the feet. Let's, gonna, let's find out some more. Otherwise, he should have come already. He should have come. No need for 1844. Let's find out about the church of God. Ephesians 1, And hath put all things under his feet, his feet is Christ's feet, and gave him, Christ, to be the head over all things of the church. So what is the feet? Church. church. What is Christ? Head. And you have the head and the whole body that makes you a church. Remember, a church is head and the body. So when he conquered Satan on the cross, he conquered. By why? But why not? Because Satan is not conquered under the feet. Who's the feet? Ah. So the cross is only the beginning of the sanctuary. It's only the first step of the sanctuary. You have the holy and the most holy place. So Christ conquered Satan. Christ did it. But Christ is going to say, no, I'm going to bruise him under your feet. Let's find out. Colossians 1 8. As he is the head of the body, and the body is the. So the feet is the what? The body. That means the body, the feet is the church. So that means when Christ overcome, that's the head overcoming. But he says, I'm going to overcome not only the head, but my feet is going to overcome Satan's accusation. Let's go to Romans 6.20. Here it is. Here's the text. And the God of peace shall bruise, isn't this Genesis 3.15 language? Bruise Satan under whose feet? So who's going to answer Satan's accusation? The church. The church. Not until then will Christ come. Christ show an example of how to conquer Satan and then the feet will follow his example and bruise Satan under our feet. And who did God expect to bruise Satan under his feet? Who is that person or people? SDA. SDA. That was his expectation in 1844. It says, okay, and your feet shod or shoot with the preparation of the, that means the feet represent the gospel. How about if we have the wrong gospel? Hmm. Whose feet is going to be bruised? Or whose head? Nobody's. Nobody. Wrong gospel? Wrong feet? Satan said, I'm not afraid of that kind of gospel. How about the gospel like this? We can never stop sinning. Is that the feet of the gospel? That's the wrong feet. I don't think we will ever stop sinning. Satan said, that the kind of gospel that's going to bruise my head? Never. That's my accusation. You cannot stop. And you said your gospel says you cannot stop sinning? That's like, that sounds like my gospel. Mm -hmm. Let's find out more. And sh how shall they preach except they be sent? It is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the that means you got the wrong gospel you got the wrong feet mm -hmm. Satan is not afraid mm -hmm. here's the question mm -hmm. why is Christ not returning yet because the people the feet is not moving <laughs> yeah. or the wrong feet the wrong, the wrong gospel mm -hmm. we got the wrong gospel yeah. we got the wrong gospel because feet represent what? Gospel. We got the wrong gospel. The, the feet follow the wrong path. That's right. Wrong path. Because the path is being led by another gospel. We're going to learn there's another gospel. Feet represent the gospel. Okay? Revelation 14, 7. Here it is. And I saw another angel. We read this. Everlasting 
So it is. And God says, there is going to be a people who has the everlasting gospel, and they're going to be produced in my day of judgment. Who is that? I don't know. Who has the gospel? They are the one. They're going to fulfill Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity. What is enmity? Hatred. Hatred toward what? Sin. SDA should be the model for people who have total hatred for sin. That's why SDA was raised, to be a model of sin-hating people. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a demonstration. So are we demonstrating the gospel, which is hatred for sin? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can see why we're still here. Mm -hmm. And if we don't know this message, we will continue to be here mm -hmm. for who knows how long, who's going to get eventually get this message and eventually going to help us be resurrected if we're faithful. Because if we don't get this message, Jesus will never come. Why? Because Satan needs an answer. How come you raise him up? Yet I haven't had my answer yet. They continue to sin. You just forgive them. I said they cannot stop sinning without you forgiving them. Stop forgiving them. How about if they stop sinning? Oh, I gotta forgive them. If that's the case, how about you forgive me? That's why you're saying to God. And God said, Oh, I cannot do that. Well, how come you're forgiving them? So God has to have people who live, never die, and would rather die than to sin. Mm -hmm. Then Satan will be answered. And he expects that from Seventh-day Adventists beginning 1844. Wow. Unfortunately, we have lost that idea already. Then, the end will come. There it is. That's why there is Seventh-day Adventist. The message proclaimed by the angel flying in the midst of heaven in the everlasting gospel is the same gospel that was declared in Eden when the serpent said, I will put enmity. That's it. That means when God says, I'm going to put hatred between you, He's talking to Adventism. I'm going to put hatred. And then, to answer God indirectly, or to read God's mind after reading this, ah, you're talking about producing those people in 1844 called the Advent Movement. So who's going to fulfill Genesis 3.15? The Advent Movement. Well, they're supposed to fulfill it, but they have failed miserably. Okay, let's take a look at the enmity. I, God says, I will put enmity. You cannot, or you and I cannot have hatred unless God places it there. Okay, let's take a look at the hatred, enmity. Those who refuse to receive reproof and to be corrected will manifest enmity, malice, and hatred against the instrument that God had used. Man, feel sorry for the instrument. Don't feel sorry for the message. The message cannot feel anything. The instrument. Yeah. So, you know what? I'm just, I just happen to bring God's message. And you're not supposed to marry your brother's wife, Herod. Because of that, he lost his head. Yeah. Oh, what an instrument. No wonder they watered it down the message so much. Because they love their head so much. See? They will have enmity. That's the type of hatred. You know what? It's better that one man die and then the whole nation die. That type of hatred. Because of what? Reprove and correct it. Why? Because they love sin so much. More than God. That's the type of enmity. That means the enmity that God plays is I hate sin so much I would rather so backward. We are to have the hatred for sin as Sadat Mesek Abednego had the hatred for sin. That's an example of Seventh-day Adventist God was to raise in 1844. Sadat Mesek Abednego. Go ahead, King. We're not careful to answer you. We're not going to bow down. Go ahead, play the music again. We're never going to bow down. That type of hatred. Wasn't King Charles II Many people 
don't have no clue. Yeah, we did not see him. No clue. This is the first time that I understand. No clue why we're who we are. We are seven brothers. No clue. That's why. Not, not even fourth generation South American. Right. Because we lost it. We lost it, the very purpose. In other words, this was a lost. Oh, lost. Yeah. yeah. The fact that God is showing us this truth again shows that we're in the last days. Mm. That's the yeah. fact. The fact that He's digging it up. Yeah. And yeah, I can tell you, Andrea, I can tell you, if this message, the fact that it's coming back into not on the surface, it's interesting. It's not coming in through the pulpit. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's the key. It's being denied. It's not in the pulpit. It's not in the pulpit it's being at all. Denied. Isn't that where it should be? Yes, it should be. And it's not. Not only not, it's denied. That's scary denied. stuff. Yeah. That is Being scary. Yeah. Covered. That is very scary. Yeah. So that's the type of hatred. Let's continue on. And the way I see it also, like, if you preach the outside the church, in this one, it's more accepted than mm. outside. Yeah. That's the that's, 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 that's That shows how disconnected to Christ is already. Mm. So disconnected. So big time. Reverend Harold, in the heart, heart is mine, right? Mm-hmm. In the heart of mine of Jesus was hatred of nothing but sin. Wow. Mm-hmm. That means God hates sin so much. Mm-hmm. I was just sharing Saturday night with our uh, brother, sister in California. This is the type of hatred God has for sin. He hates sin so much. God hates sin so much that he would permit his son to experience get rid of sin. That means his hatred for sin to the point I let my son die so that sin could be totally eradicated from the universe. That's how much he hated. And on the other hand, on the same token, on the other you know on the side other side of the token, he hates sin so much that he would allow his son to die. So that sinners like you and I could live. Mm-hmm. That means he loves you and I so much mm-hmm. that he chose his beloved son to die so the people who hate him so much might have a chance to live. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he, he had a choice. Okay, sinners or your son? I would let my son die. Mm-hmm. For who? Those rebellious people. Oh. And I guess, I don't know what kind of love that is. <laughs> and that's the type of Genesis 3.15, hatred. Mm-hmm. And you said, okay, that means if I love God, and if I want to be true someday I'm living, I would rather die than to break it. Mm-hmm. That's the type of people God will present to Satan. Here's my sa- answer, Satan. Here's my answer. Go ahead and try that. Because I know. They would rather die than to break my law. And they will prove to you that they will not break my law. And Satan will try that. And they said, go ahead, throw me into a fiery furnace. Because I'd rather die than to disappoint my God. That's what God is waiting for. That's it. That's it. That's what's going to happen is coming. But that's why we're studying right now. The most important thing for me from every study is the result of the study, right? Mm-hmm. And the result is, do I hate sin more and more every day? That's it. That's it. All the study, all the knowledge, if it doesn't produce any greater hatred, hatred for sin, then I have failed to, all my studies pretty much fail because it does not produce what God expects to produce out of me. So do I hate sin more and more? It says, let this hatred of sin. Mine, right? Let this mind or let the hatred of sin be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And what is the hatred of sin? i rather die than to allow those rebellious to not even have a chance to live. It doesn't say I die, but make sure you guarantee you're going to accept me, right? No, no. I die even though only one be saved. Oh, man. Incomprehensible. Yeah. <laughs> beyond our imagination what love is. That's why we have a whole eternity to just define what love is. And eternity is not enough to define what love is. 
we just don't know what love is. Mm. But we can show what love is by choosing to die to self. Mm. Die to self. And he's on the missionary at preaching the wrong gospel. Yeah, it is. It's pointing to the direction that has nothing to do with hastening Christ's coming. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do. Mm -hmm. Nothing. It does not hasten him any sooner than he should come. And and why yeah. wait? And one thing with that is like the damage is done. And you cannot even explain to them this mess is done. And that's, that's the weird part. Yeah. So, you know, we don't have to die because 144,000 will not die. But what is required of us is to die to self. Because self pull is so strong. So for me to die is to die to self. In other words, Lord, not my desire, not my flesh, not my appetite. No, even though I want it so much. No, I will crucify self so that your will may be done. That's death to self. That's just self. That's suffering. Yeah. God went through suffering. He says, if you follow me, you must suffer. And that's death to self. That means, well, I don't have to die. Nobody, may, I may never have the choice of going to the fire furnace or not, but I will face those decisions every day yeah. when myself wants something and I say, no. Mm -hmm. If no. this has been taught in the very beginning, it will be very easy to understand what is perfection. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. This is well, it. You have it's to foundation. Be perfect. Yeah. yeah. Because well, it's right there. What it is. Yeah. It's right there. So simple. Simple. Because it's between Satan's accusation and God's responsibility in answering his accusation. Foolish people. I think the witness there did not understand what God witnessed. That's right. When you show that you hate Witness is demonstration. Right. You That's demonstrate right. that you hate sin. That's right. The gospel shall be preached. Well, let's learn a little bit about the gospel. Right? What is the gospel? The truths of the gospel and the teaching of the Holy Spirit. Here it is. The truth of the gospel and the teaching of the Holy Spirit will produce us brokenness of heart. What? Hatred of sin. That means, Auntie Maria, we have been receiving the wrong yes. gospel. That's the key. That's the key. There was just a very minimal understanding. Yeah. We have been fed the wrong gospel. And it is very logical, now, yeah. you know. Makes sense. That's why I said it's not of the emotion. Yeah. That's Genesis 3.15. Mm -hmm. The everlasting gospel is the same gospel that was preached in Eden. And yeah. the gospel is, I will put hatred. That means gospel produce hatred. Yeah. Uh -huh. No hatred, wrong gospel. It's just that simple. That's the formula. No hatred, wrong gospel. Okay, let's go. And right here, and an understanding of your self. biggest self. enemy. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. Self. There it is. The gospel will learn that, man, I am my biggest enemy, not other people. Yeah. So those people, oh, what about yourself? Wrong gospel again. No, no matter Wrong how they chastise me, if I don't react to it, it's not that's that's right. <laughs> when did you slap a dead person and he slapped you back? <laughs> <laughs> Never, right? Never. Because he's dead. <laughs> when did Christ ever slap people back? He's <laughs> dead to sell. <laughs> that's a key, man. <laughs> All who are not decided followers of Christ are servants of Satan. Mm -hmm. wow. Only two, right? Either black or white. Are servants. Decided, that means, well, should I follow God or not yet? Well, that's servant of Satan right there. It's either, okay, I'm going to leave all my nets, follow him. I'm going to leave my uh, IRS, IRS booth, Matthew. I'm going to leave my tax collecting booth and follow him. Not, oh, Lord, I'm going to bury my... Son. Oh, that's... Because how can you say not yet to the creator of the universe? Let's, let's logic this. How can you say not yet to the one who created everything? There's no not yet in God. <laughs> oh, man. 
Unbelievable. There's no not yet in God. Yes, Lord. Yes, mm -hmm. Lord. No. Well, later. Oh, wow. Continue on. In the unregenerate heart, there is love of sin mm -hmm. and a disposition to cherish and excuse it. In the renewed heart, there is hatred of sin and determined resistance against it. Oh, that's the key. That means, no, I don't want to. No, Lord. I know my flesh wants to, but no, Lord. That's a struggle. But no struggle? Like, oh, well, next time I'll just struggle. Oh, no. At least there's struggle. At least there is resistance. But no resistance? Well, I got up on the wrong side of the bed. You know what? At least that one. At least resistance. No, Lord. No, 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 no. Even though flesh is so strong. No, Lord, help me, Lord. I don't want to fall again. No. That's renewed heart. Okay, vindication. That's the type of people God was to raise in 1844. And the question is, Lord says, what happened to my people? He probably looked to the other side of the universe and looked back. What happened to my people? This is not the one I raised. Wait a minute. Did I raise people like this? No, I don't, I don't remember these people. Oh, man. Unbelievable. It's so different. So long. If Mrs. White were to raise today, she probably say, yeah. is this another world? I don't remember anything about my work here. There's no trace of my work. Oh, unbelievable. The vindication. Okay. And he said unto me, after 2300 years, I'm going to cleanse my people from their sins. And the word cleanse means vindicate. And vindicate means to be free from allegation. Who's being accused here? God. That means when he says, I'm going to cleanse the sanctuary, he's going to free himself from Satan's allegation that his law cannot be kept. When? 1844. 1844. He was to vindicate his character through his people. And we know sanctuary is another word for temple. And temple says, you are the temple of God. That means he's going to vindicate his character through you and me. He's going to prove through the universe, through the Seventh-day Adventist movement, that Satan is the biggest liar. Raven Herald, April 16. All heaven since 1844. This is what happened since 1844. All heaven is waiting to hear us vindicate God's law. And we just kept them waiting longer and longer with no hope of an end to the way. Declaring to be holy, just and good. And here's the big question. Where are those who will do this work? Where's the people? Where's the people? 1901, Miss White says, where's the people? I know I raised this church with my husband. He's dead because he worked too hard. Not for this, though. Not for this. Oh, man. Where are the people who's going to do the work? Vindicate God's law. Where are the people? The honor of the law of God is to be vindicated before the unfallen world, before the heavenly universe, and before the fallen world. That means God has never received his full honor because we, because we are the very cause why he did not receive it. Christ never received honor because we did not give him his honor by continuing because it is his honor that is to be vindicated through the whole universe and he never received his honor that is past due past due so these are the very things while we are saying Lord I'm going to go to heaven I'm going to go to heaven he says well how about you receive you give me my honor first because Satan kept taunting me saying where's the people where's the people and you want to come over here you think Satan's going to like it I can just snap, you know, just zap you and go to heaven and say, this is, wait a minute. 
why are you taking them like that? No, no, no. Bring them down back because they're mine. And God says, oops. And Satan says, I told you, you got to change your law because they cannot keep it. And I cannot keep it too. And he says, see, the fact that people sin because it's too hard and that's my excuse. So you got to forgive me. Oh. Then we're dead. We're dead. And then we're going to live in a universe with Satan forever <laughs> as ruler because he proved Satan, God to be alive. How do you like that idea? <laughs> oh, man. That's why Christ never come because he will never come unless he could prove Satan wrong. That's what Seventh-day Adventists is all about. The very image of God is to re be reproduced in humanity. Remember, the honor of God, right? Mm -hmm. The honor of God, the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of the character of His people. That's the word. That's the word that caused so much allergic reaction. <laughs> <laughs> Perfection. <laughs> and that's talking about the honor of God. That means if I said I can never be perfect, God will never receive his honor. Mm -hmm. The jump, the study of perfection is what he said. Yeah. My, my, my. Jump the study of perfection. Well, the people of God. Now let's take a look at the people of God. It's unbelievable. Satan is to work to misrepresent the character of God that he may seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. If there was ever a people in need of constantly increasing light from heaven, it is the people that, in this time of peril, God has called to be the depositories of his law and to vindicate his character before the world. So Satan is always misrepresenting God. And God says, I need a people to represent me because I am being misrepresented by Satan. The message of the first, second, third angels, he has separated a people from the churches and from the world to bring them into a sacred nearness to himself. He has made them the depositories of his law and has committed to them the great truths of prophecy for this time. Like the holy oracles committed to the ancient Israel, these are a sacred trust to be communicated to the world. So who are the people God chose to separate from the world to represent Him because He is so misrepresented by the world? Okay, here's the answer. Seventh-day Adventists are now to stand for separate and distinct. A people named by the Lord as his own, denominated. Until they do this, he cannot be glorified in them. Who did God choose to represent his character in the midst of his, the misrepresentation of his character? Seventh day and this. Fail. F minus. F minus. Fail miserably. Because they have joined the ranks of the enemy misrepresent God's character by saying we will never be perfect in this side of the in this side of heaven never be perfect oh man who are these God's denominated people oh well, you know that's the Adventist. who are these those who on this earth have witnessed to their loyalty who are they those who have kept the commandment of God and testimony of Jesus those who have owned the crucified one as their savior that's supposed to be SDA. That's supposed to be SDA. Who are these? SDA. Who are these? SDA. God's dynamic. So God named them. When do you name somebody? Birth and marriage. You give a name, right? The wife? That means God was married to some of the The relationship between church and uh, Christ. So we are that close to Christ. And we are misrepresenting him. God chose us to say, could somebody represent my character because 
since the whole world doesn't know my character, somebody please, please represent me. Okay, I'm gonna raise some down there. So is God calling a group of people to represent him today? Same thing, he's doing the same thing here. Now, the fact that we're studying this, God is calling us to represent him now. Same stuff, the same thing again. He's doing the same thing. And the dragon was wrought with the woman. Here it is. God kept God's commandment. Testimony. So he says, who are these, right? Who are these people? Seventh-day Adventists, right? Seventh-day Adventists are denominated. Separate. In order to be denominated, they have to be separate and unique. Different. And it says, who are these people? They have kept testimony, a commandment, and testimony. That was supposed to be who? Seventh-day Adventists. And then, we ask the question again, who are those people? And he says, who are these? Who are they? Who have kept commandment and testimony? And Revelation 12, 17 has the answer. The remnant. The remnant. The remnant. The, remnant. the left over of the chosen ones. Remnant means the left over. The very ones at the very end, which is the very minority, there. Who are these? Who are they? They're the remnant. We're still seven day Adventists. We are still. The only difference is we're just the remnant of the big body who have already rejected the message. The we're just a remnant. Terrible. We're just a remnant. <laughs> okay, what has Christ been doing since October 22, 1844? Right? What has Christ been doing since then? James 5, 7 through 8. Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be also patient, establish your heart for the coming of the Lord toward night. So what has God been doing since then? Waiting for the fruit of his own character to be represented. He has been waiting. Malachi 3, how is Christ waiting? Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And who is this specifically uh, referring to? Yes. Willa Miller. Willa Miller. <coughs> which, is, uh, which, is, which is just like uh, John the Baptist. John the Baptist, first advent, Willa Miller, second advent. This is talking about Willa Miller. And the Lord whom you seek, what does Malachi mean by whom you seek? Expect him to come in October 22. Suddenly appear in the temple in heaven. That's the one. Suddenly. Suddenly means unexpected, right? So they waited and then they realized, oh, he's moving from the holy to the most holy. This is talking about 1844. Even the messenger of covenant whom you light, he shall come. But who may abide when he enter the most holy place? Who shall stand when he appear in the most holy place? And who may appear? Who may abide? Those who go through the fire. Refiner's fire. And his position, he shall sit. A refiner, a purifier. We're going to find out about sit because sit, once you finish, you what? Stand. Sitting means he's still working. He shall purify the sons of Levi, purge them as gold, so that he may offer us unto the Lord an offering of righteousness. So he's been waiting, he's been sitting in front of the pot of gold, waiting for his character to be manifested be reflected right okay continue on when the fruit is brought forth immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest come Christ is waiting here it is with longing desire for the manifestation of himself and his church when the character of Christ shall be perfect <coughs> man <coughs> I think kindergarten could not understand this <laughs> perfectly reproduced in who? His people. Then he will come. How can you, knowing this, say you cannot be perfect? How can you, knowing this quotation, how many Adventists do not know this quotation? Maybe the ones baptized and never show up. Maybe that's the one. But growing up, we know this quotation even though we don't know where. He will come to claim them as his own. Perfectly reproduced. That's what he's been doing since 1844. That means what What will hasten Christ's coming? Character. That means will Christ come when there is no perfection of character? 
That's the key. So the question is, why is Christ not coming? Because he has not reproduced his character perfectly in his people. That means we can hasten or we can go to grave hoping that somebody, some generation after us will eventually get it. Or we can actually finish the work ourselves. I choose to finish as long as God gives me life. I'm going to finish with, you know, whatever I can do to finish because to say I'm tired of this world, well, it's one thing to be tired. Do you believe this? And what do you do about this? Mm -hmm. That's the key. We can hasten Christ coming by individually and within the family first. At least know other family first, right? <coughs> just within the family and then neighbors and then you never know. Just make sure I take care of my family and stuff and then neighbor will follow. And at that time, Michael stand up. And when he stand up, at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written. Here's the judgment. That means judgment is finished. All the people name retained, blotted out, finished. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. That means if your name is written, that means you no longer sin. No longer sin. When Michael stand up, your name will be retained when you stop sinning. Your name will be blotted out when you continue to sin. That's it. That's simple. <clears throat> but one blot upon the character, one sin unconfessed and unrepented of will close for you the gates of the city of God. One sin. That's it. That's the end of it. One sin. Unbelievable, scary stuff. That's why, before I go to bed, have all my sins been repented of and forgiven. That's key. Because, once again, many are living a presumptuous life. That's very scary. <laughs> Assuming that they have to be, they have to get up tomorrow. They have to. And yet, there's no guarantee. That's why every day in the morning, Lord, thank you so much. It is because of your grace. That means the, the fact that you allow me to live, there's a purpose for why I'm alive today. Wow. And Lord, what is your purpose? May I fulfill your purpose today? Because mm -hmm. if not, I'm just wasting another day, not knowing what I'm alive for. And God says, you're just wasting my energy and my oxygen here doing nothing. Oh, man. And yet we can hasten his coming. Spirit of Prophecy 252. The book here referred is the book of records in heaven where every name is recorded, their acts, their sins, and obedience, and faithfully written. When anyone commits sin which are too grievous for the Lord to pardon, their names are erased from the book and they are devoted to destruction. Oh. These are the very things that we have to deal with every day before we go to bed. Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our character have one spot or stain upon them. It is left with us to remedy defects in our character. To cleanse. What is cleanse? Isn't that the work of 1844? That's our work. To cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. This, Advocates should know this. That's why we're raised, right? Philippians 2.12. This is my text I use so much. Work out your own salvation. Not other people's salvation, your own salvation with fear and trembling. What is fear? Fear God. That means to work out your own salvation is to know the first English message, which is the everlasting gospel. To work out my salvation is to understand the gospel. What is my salvation? First, second, third English message. And that's the message that will crush Satan in his head, on his head. <laughs> Only those who receive the seal of God have will have the passport through the gates of the city of God and seal means no spot no spot no stain so it's very clear the requirement for us to enter now nah, here's the question here's the big question why the delay why has Christ not come yet that's the big question Galatians 1 6 7 here it is remember our feet are to be gospel right Satan is to be crushed under our feet representing the gospel. I marvel 
that ye are so soon removed from him that call you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. There it is. Why do you believe another gospel? That's what Paul is saying. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. That means in the same gospel, you just twist it around a little bit. Still have the same label, but different content already. <clears throat> That's the reason why. Jude 1, 3, 5. Beloved, when I give diligence, all diligence to you, to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Why? For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of all ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men, turning, perversion, right? Mm -hmm. The grace of our Lord unto, into lasciviousness denying the Lord only Lord our Lord Jesus Christ that means there are people who turn the gospel around and that's our feet and then it is through our feet Satan is good to be crushed <clears throat> that means this is the message that Satan used so that his head would never be crushed <clears throat> another gospel and then he jumps to five I will therefore put you in remembrance though ye once knew this how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroy them that believe not. In other words, they have been called out of bondage, but never made it into the promised land. Or who were called out of darkness? SDA. But not all will make it. Same thing. Why? Because the perverted gospel same stuff the same thing same thing only two right enter with those who are be under 20 i think only two adults same thing we have another gospel and not all who came out of 1844 will make it all right evangelism 696 had adventist after the 1844 disappointment held fast to our faith Mem remember in jude Content for the faith? Well, did they contend for the faith? Obviously not. <laughs> Had they contend for the faith after 1844 and follow on unitedly in the opening providence of God? Had they received this, received the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaiming it to the world, they would have seen the salvation of God. The Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts. The work would have been completed and Christ would have come. Air to this, this to receive his people to their reward. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. Same thing. <laughs> Are we in our prophetic 40 years wandering in the wilderness? Yes. Same thing. Perverted gospel. Same thing. Hebrew 3, 17, 19. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief in the gospel. Man. Now, when I, when I really get, when I was just preparing this, and when I realized, it dawned on me, I am so confident that the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists is not God's chosen people. I'm so confident because of this. They reject the health reform. They reject the gospel. They are making friends with Vatican. They are so not God's people. This confirms me so much. Because they are everything but against this message. Perfection against. You know, everything. So I am so confirmed. Just by looking at this, they cannot be God's people, or God cannot use them. Individually, maybe, but as an organization, I don't see it anymore because they went to so far, man. They are hugging the Pope already. It's impossible. Hebrews 4 1 and 2. Let us therefore fear. Why? Lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, and of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them 
we got the gospel, they got the gospel too. And they reject the gospel, we're also rejecting the gospel that we should come short of it. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Same thing. So no faith, we don't believe. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God that could save me only if I no believe. So preach the gospel, preach the gospel, but they don't really believe. They don't believe, no faith. You can preach the gospel all you want, but if you don't believe it, you cannot demonstrate it. And he said unto me, what is power? Grace. Strength. So what is being rejected? Grace. I'm going to go back to Jude, okay? Remember, gospel is grace. Go back to Jude quickly. Certain men unawares who are before all ordained condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace. Yes, the grace. What is grace? The power of God. What does the power of God can do? Save me from my sin. They said, I cannot be saved from sin. I have to be saved in my sin. That's the message today. I am saved in my sin. They don't believe that the power of God is sufficient. <clears throat> so, same thing. By whom we have received grace, and I receive grace for what purpose? Obedience. Is there any obedience? No. But is is the word grace misunderstood? Yes, because they think well, grace is just the love of God. Grace is sufficient. It's enough. The grace is enough. No, no. You receive grace for obedience. So that you obey. That's what grace means. Not God loves you and He's going to forgive you. <clears throat> what happened when you obey? Seeing you have purified your souls in. So you're not purified. Remember Malachi 3? Purifier, refiner, while He's sitting down. It is through grace that enables you to obey that purify. What is another word for purify? Cleanse. What is the gospel? Grace. That means the 1844 message is the message of the gospel because of grace. And grace allowed me to be cleansed. That means reject grace, no cleansing. No cleansing? What's the purpose of 1844? If we have people not cleansed. Because of <laughs> grace, we are not cleansed. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, 7, 12, 13. But unto every one of us is given grace. And grace is a what? Gift. Why did God give us grace? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for edifying the body of Christ. How perfect are we to be perfect? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. How perfect? Unto the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's in the Bible. How perfect does God expect me to be perfect? As Christ is perfect. And what allows me to do that? Grace. But they have turned the grace into a lasciviousness. When they reject perfection, it's impossible already. <coughs> impossible. The Lord in His great mercy sent a most precious message to His people through Wagner and Jones. Not Joseph, Joshua and Caleb, but Wagner and Jones. His message was to bring more prominently before the world uplifted Savior. The sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, it presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many has lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to His divine power, His marriage, His changeless love for all the, the human family. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gift. Remember, gift was Ephesians 4, grace unto man, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third, 1844, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of the Spirit in a large, that's 1888. So what was the grace to produce the loud cry of the third angel's message? Now let's continue on. <clears throat> An unwillingness to yield up preconceived opinions or PCI and to accept this truth 
lay at the foundation of a large share of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against the Lord's message through Wagner and Jones. By exciting that opposition, Satan succeeded in shedding away from our people in a great measure the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart to them. The enemy prevented them from obtaining that efficiency which might have been theirs in carrying the truth to the world as the apostles proclaim it after the day of Pentecost, that's Sunday law. This, the light that is to lighten the whole earth with the glory, Revelation 18 verse 1, was resisted. And the action of our own brethren has been in a great degree kept away from the world. That's, they continue to reject the message. 1888, remember, if they were to receive, Christ would have come. Because they reject, that's why we're still here. I truly believe that God is repeating the 1888 now. Because we're receiving the same message and we got the same response of it being rejected again. Same stuff. Same by the leaders. Same. They never learn from the lesson. The impatient souls. Okay. This is in context to don't give anything to anybody when we ourselves do not have it. Yeah. Which is the gospel. So impatient. I want to I wanna go through the world. I want to give the gospel. We should ask, which gospel? Yes. Mm -hmm. Which gospel are you? Oh, that Jesus loves me. He died for me. You don't need that. The evangelicals do a very good job at it already. <laughs> More successful than you probably. At least they live it. Oh, man. It's unbelievable. The impatient souls. <clears throat> Second Samuel 18, 5, 10, 15, 19 to 33. And the king commanded Joab and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. So we know Absalom rebelled. Mm -hmm. And David said, please deal gently with him. He's my son, okay? Mm -hmm. And all the people heard when the king gave all the captains charge concerning Absalom. And a certain man saw it and told Joab and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hang in an oak. Mm -hmm. Like this is our opportunity. And the ten, the ten young men that bear Joab's armor come past about and smote Absalom and slew him. Now jump to 15. Then said Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, let me now run and bear the king tidings how that the Lord had avenged him of his enemies. I'm going to tell this bad news to the king. Let me go. I'm going to be the messenger. And Job said unto him, you're not going to do it today. Oh no, you're not. You're not going to bear tidings today. But you shall bear tiding another day. In other words, don't go. You're not going today. Another day, yes, but not now. But this day you shall have no tidings because, here's, the king's son is dead. That means you don't know how to report death to the king. It's not your specialty. You're not going. All right. Okay. Continue on. Then said Job to Cushy. Cushi, go tell the king what thou hast seen. And Cushi bowed himself unto Job and ran. So Cushi was sent. Ahimaaz was not allowed to go. Then said Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, yet again to Job. But howsoever, let me, I pray thee, also run after Cushi. So he's impatient here. He's talking about impatience, all right. No, let me go. And Job said, Wherefore will thou run, my son, seeing that thou hast no tidings ready? What is tithing? Gospel. Here's the gospel. You don't have any gospel to tell people. You're not going. No, I want to go. I want to preach the gospel. No, you have nothing to share. No, I want to go. But howsoever said he, let me run. And he said unto him, run. Go ahead then. You want to go? Go ahead. Then Ahimaaz ran by the way of the plain and overran Cushy. Oh, he can run faster. <laughs> Even though he has nothing to share. <laughs> Man, we got people running all over the world having gospel, which is pretty much Jesus loves me. And, man, you know, I got to preach the gospel. What are you going to share? Well, you know, that Jesus died for you. Ooh. Here's the thing. Why did God raise Adventists? To demonstrate hatred for sin. So if you don't have, to have hatred for sin, are you Ahimaaz or Kushi? Mm -hmm. Isn't that how the gospel is be sent to the world? It says, 
and this gospel shall be preached unto all skins and town for a witness. So I have to witness, I have to demonstrate hatred for sin. Mm -hmm. So if, if I don't have hatred for sin, what do I have to tell? Nothing. They're gonna be even save more lives. So. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's Ahimaaz right there. He keep running. And Ahimaaz called and said unto King, All is well. Okay? <laughs> Every, everything's good. <laughs> And he fell down to the earth upon his face before the king and said, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which hath delivered up the men that lifted up their hand against my lord the king. Deliver up, okay? And David says, I want details. The king said, Is the young man Absalom safe? That's too general. Okay, you know, the people who rebel has been delivered up. Okay, I want to be more specific. How about my son? So, how about my son Absalom? Is he safe? And Ahimaaz answered, When Job sent the king's servant, and me thy servant, I saw a great tumult, but I don't know what it was. <laughs> I saw a commotion, but I have no idea what it was. Then why are you here? <laughs> so what gospel do you have to preach? Jesus loves you. Okay, we know that already. Yeah. What's new? You know, Adventists don't go to the world and we don't show the people that we hate sin. That's, right. That's our message. Mm -hmm. And yet, we are so gung-ho about going, having no message whatsoever. Because we don't know, even know what we are, who we are, why we're raised up. That's very, very true. <laughs> we got nothing. We pass the great controversy, which we ourselves have never read. Step to Christ. Oh, that's a powerful book. It's only this thick. Have you read it? Not yet. When you read it, never understood it. Well, at least I know the first one is, you know, God's love for man. Oh, man. How is Christ going to ever come like that? Because we don't know who we are anymore. We have no idea who we are. I don't know what it was. And the king said, turn aside. Stand over here. Like, move out of the way. Aside, still still. Let's be quiet. Okay? Don't talk anymore. <laughs> you have nothing to share with me. And he beheld, behold, Cushi come. And Cushi said, Tidings, my lord the king, for the lord had avenged thee this day of all the men that rose up against thee. And the king said, I want to know my son. Nothing to that impatient soul. We don't even know who we are. We don't even know why we exist. And we try to tell people about God. That's Patriarchs and prophets. And Ahimaaz called and said to the king, All is well. And he fell down to the earth upon his face before the king and said, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which hath delivered up the man that lifted up their hand against my lord the king. Then the king eager inquired, Is the young man Absalom safe? Ahimaaz returned an evasive answer. <laughs> well, <clears throat> well, beating around the bush, no? <clears throat> well, how should I say this? Well, he doesn't know. You know what? Why don't you just stay inside? Okay, I got really nothing to come. The second messenger came crying, Tidings, my lord the king, for the lord had avenged thee this day of all the men that rose up against thee. Again, from the father's lips came the absorbing <coughs> question Is the young man Absalom safe? Unable to conceal the heavy tidings, the herald answered, The enemies of my lord the king and all that rise against thee to do thee hurt be as that young man is. It was enough. How about this? What should I do to inherit eternal life? Well, if you love God enough. How about sin? Well, just do your best. And God will do the rest. How about God hates sinners and no sin will ever enter the pearly gates of heaven. And God can give you the power let go of the sin that you love so much. Because no sin will ever enter heaven. But I'm a seventh day How much more are you? Not well, seventh day is different than his chosen people, right? See, this watered down message. This so watered down message. These days we get the peace and safety all over the place. But well, you know, God loves sinners so much. How could he let so many Adventists die? Well, I don't care. If you're a sinner, you're dead. But no, Adventists cannot die. Man, this is giving big time false hope. And there are so many having this false hope 
which is their only hope for heaven, which is a false hope. Because the truth they cannot bear, they hang on the hope, even though it's false, at least there's hope. That is called believe a lie. God shall send them strong delusion that they might believe a lie. There it is. Second Testament 2, 9 to 11. They would believe a lie. It is enough. There is it. David questioned no further, but with bowed head, he went up to the chamber. My son, my son, Absalom. So we need to have a message to the world. But before we give a message, we got to know why, who we are, and what we are about. Why God raised us, and what is his expectation. Yeah. Early writings. I, saw, I also saw that God had messengers that he would use in his cause, but they were not ready. There it is. Not ready. Not ready. Ahimaaz, you're not ready today. They were too light and trifling, lacking in significance, to exert good influence over the flock and did not feel the weight of the cause and the worth of souls as God's messenger must feel in order to be to affect good. That means they don't care for the souls. If I care for the souls, even though it hurt, I'm going to tell the truth. But if I don't care, you know what? As long as you're happy with me and we're still friends, who cares if you're lost? Because you don't care for the souls. If you care for souls, you will tell the truth, even though it hurts. That's care. That's when you're, you're actually, what is, what is called it, uh, buying and selling souls. Yeah, there it is. That's what it means. Yeah, merchandising souls. That's, That's, what it means. Merchandising That's it. souls. Exactly. Because, you know, you really, just yeah. as long as you come in, you don't really care about him. You know, it's not about salvation. That's why God says, you're not ready. You have nothing to get because you're not representing me. As a matter of fact, you're misrepresenting me. I'm not going to send you. But they said, Lord, I'm going to go anyway. Well, go for it. <laughs> and then God, oh, okay, we're going to have some, uh, some quotation. I'm going to say something, but we're going to see in the quotation. Said the angel, be clean that bear the vessel. So you must be clean. How are you clean? Cleanse. Cleanse? 1844. In other words, if you're not cleansed, you're not going to be sent. Be clean vessel. Be clean that bear the vessel of the Lord. Twice he said. They can accomplish but little good unless they are wholly given up to God and feel the importance and solemnity of the last message of mercy that is now being given to the scattered flock. Some who are not called of God are very willing to go with the message. <laughs> we want to go, Lord. Well, I must, you have no message. But if they felt the weight of the cause, and the responsibilities of such a station, they would feel to shrink back and say with the apostle, who is sufficient for these things? Mm -hmm. They only know. This is no playing game. They said, oh, I don't think I'm going to go. One reason why they are so willing to go is that God has not laid upon the weight of the cause. Because if they know what it takes to be God's messenger, they said, uh, I don't want to go. <laughs> Miss White? Be my prophet. No way. Because I know to be prophet, everybody's going to mock me. They're going to be calling me fanatic. Oh no, I'm not going to be. And his wife said she doesn't want to. But there are so many people who want to go when they have nothing. And it's the reason why they want to go is because they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> because if they know what they're doing, I'm not going. Man. Not all who proclaim the first and second angel's message are to give the third. Yes. Even after they fully embrace it, even if you accept it, for some have been in so many errors and delusions that they can but just save their own souls. How much more the souls of others? And if they undertake to guide others, they will be the means of overthrowing them. That's why. If you go, you're going to cause two people to stumble, not yourself. But I saw that some who have formerly run deep into fanaticism would be the first now to run before God sends them, before they are purified from their past errors, having errors mixed with the truth, they would feed the flock of God with it. And if they were suffered to go on, the flock would become sickly, and distraction and death would follow. I saw that they would have to be sifted and sifted until they were freed from all their errors or they could never enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. 
you know what? Our organization have <coughs> no message to give to the world. No, nothing, nothing. It is based on those who are no longer connected to it, nor who was not breastfeeding from the mother church because they have nothing. Even for their own souls, they cannot. And that's more for the others. And the gospel shall be preached in all the world for a demonstration. It is to be demonstrated. Not to be heard. It doesn't say to be heard. Because if it's heard, Jesus should have come if it's just about being heard. It is to be demonstrated. No wonder he never come yet. Manuscript release 5. The standard must not be placed so low that those who accept the truth shall transgress God's commandment while professing to obey them. Mm -hmm. Better, far better, would it be to leave them in darkness, darkness until they could receive the truth in its purity. purity. That's, that's the click right there. It's better to, for them to leave them there. Just leave them there until you can present it as a demonstration. There are those who are watching these people to see what is the influence of the truth upon them. So they're watching us while we, give, while we give the message. They're watching. The children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. When the claims of the Sabbath, fourth commandment, are set before them, they look to see how it is regarded by those who profess to obey it. So they want to see. Okay, you said the Sabbath. Well, why do I meet you at the market on the Sabbath? Why do I see you in the restaurant? <laughs> you know, you said the Sabbath, and here you are. They may ne never say anything, but when you come to them, I'm not interested. And we said, oh, they're lost. Lost. <laughs> and they don't want to receive it because we misrepresent, misrepresent truth. And, oh, they're lost. They reject the truth. Oh, man. It's better to leave them. They study the life and character of its advocates to learn whether these are in harmony with their profession of faith. And upon the opinions thus formed, many are influenced very largely in the acceptance or rejection of the truth. If, the people, if these people conform their lives to the Bible standard, which they have lowered so much, they will be indeed a light of the world, city set upon a hill. That's Adventism, expected to be a light upon the hill. And what is the standard he has given for all who believe in him to reach? What is the standard? Be therefore perfect. How perfect? Even as your Father in heaven is also. That's the standard. Which has been lowered. That's the standard. So the standard in the, in the day of judgment is the perfect character of God. And unless these people are produced, Satan will continue to mock God, saying, your law is impossible to keep, and you kick me out because of the law that is impossible to keep. Look at the people. This is your evidence of how, how the law is unable to be kept, because you chose them, and look at them. So Satan is basically exalting against God. He says, you chose Adventism, and look at, look at them now. You chose the children of Israel, look at them. You rejected them. Now you chose Adventists. Look at them now. And then came a remnant coming out. And he said, oh, just a little bit, I can blot them out. But this remnant is resilient. <laughs> this remnant said, oh, no. Because eventually the remnant is going to be God's answer. So Satan becomes, grew bolder and bolder because he overthrew uh, the ancient Israel. And, God, and he said, oh, you're going to raise another people. Okay, look at them now. And then in the last days, there's a remnant coming out. And this remnant is attacking now. So can you see how he hates this remnant so much? Because he thought he has been successful in the ancient Israel and in the Adventism. But now come a remnant. And then he wants to block them out. So the more we follow the message of present truth, which is God's message, the more Satan is going to hate us so much. Because just this little group of people is going to overthrow me? No way. He hates us so much. So you're gonna, we're gonna feel more wrath of the dragon more and more. <clears throat> the world can only be warned, not by hearing, by seeing those who believe the truth sanctified 
32. That's the only way there was going to be like C. Only C. Because they heard so much already. Yeah. But they haven't seen it. They have yet to see. Now, that was the impatient, right? <laughs> How about the patient soul? Well, this is the one God is waiting for. How about the patient soul? There are so many impatient souls going and giving the gospel, they don't even know. How about the patient soul? Guess what God says? Here is the patient soul. Here it is. So does God prophesy that there's going to be patient souls? Here it is. Here's the patient. He's, here it is, Satan. Here they are. This is the people. Here's the patient of saying. Here are they kept, keep the command of God and the faith of Jesus. And then that's 14, 12. And then we go back to 1 and 5. Mm -hmm. So after 12, he says, here, I want to know who the here are. And we go to 1, he says, I see the 144,000. Here's the basic. And then they sung as it were a new song. But the 144,000 could sing that song. So tomorrow we're going to study. What's that song? How come they're the only one who can sing that song? Tomorrow we're going to study about the, the privilege of the 144,000 singing the song. Song of Moses and Song of the Lamb. Yeah. How come they're able to sing? That's a, that's a powerful one. Too. So God says, here is the patient. So God will. So it has been prophesied that God will have a people. The question is, when? And I get to choose if I get to be in that group. I get to choose. So my job and our job is to get people ready for to become this patient of saints by studying and having that perfect hatred that one God wants me to have hatred over sin. Let's work out your own salvation. That's the most important thing. That's the most important thing. James 1, 2, and 4. So what is this patience? How do I have patience, right? How do I help you become patient? My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. Knowing this, when you enter diverse temptation, that the trying of your faith worketh. That means we need to be tried. Patience producing perfect, perfect, entire, wanting, nothing. That means I need to be tried. In order for God to say, here's the patience, these are the people that have been tried. Their faith. Now, yeah, there it is. Tomorrow we're going to go there. Tomorrow we're going to go there. Let's see. First, So what is the trying? Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season. If need be, ye are in heaven is through manifold temptation or diverse temptation. That the trial of your faith, much more precious than gold, perish, though it tried with. In other words, in order for me to be patient, I must go through fire. fire. Now, where's the fire? In order for God to produce the patient, where's the fire? Well, we're basically going back to Daniel. In the day of judgment, do we see fire? So when God is preparing to judge me, He makes me go through fiery trials. And as I go through fiery trials, that's God's method of showing me that He's preparing me for judgment. So don't complain, Lord, why again? You're supposed to say, thank you, Lord, you're preparing me to stand before you in the throne of God as you judge my goals. Because remove, burn all the dross, yes. And we go to Malachi, remember? As he's sitting down, he's like a refiner's fire. So God make us pass through the fire in order for us to be refined and purified and purged as gold and silver. And that's the day of judgment. The prophet Isaiah had declared that the Lord would cleanse his people from their iniquities by the spirit of his judgment. Cleanse judgment by the spirit of... There it is. Here's the fire. Fire produced... <coughs> Patience. That means we must all go through fire. The word of the Lord to Israel was, I will turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away the dross, take away all the tin. To sin, wherever is found, our God is a consuming fire. In all who submit to his power, the Spirit of God will consume sin that is consumed, not the sinner, unless he is connected to it. But if men cling to sin, they become identified with sin. Then the glory of God which destroys sin must destroy them or collateral damage mm -hmm. so i'm going to send fire and if you hold on to fire you're the collateral damage because my target is sin but you just continue to hold on to it that's the day of judgment 
and then he goes to what? His wife goes to Jacob. Yeah. Once he goes there, he says, Jacob, after his night of wrestling, the angel exclaimed, I have seen God face to face, and my life is... Who is Jacob? These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he go. 144,000, right? Being translated from the earth among the living, counted as the first fruit. These are they which come out of the great tribulation, have passed through the time of trouble, which is the time of Jacob's... The 144,000, just like Jacob, having the patience of the saints. They have been delivered, have stood without an intercessor be through the final outpouring of God's judgment. But they have been delivered, washed, made white, in their mouth was no guile without fault before God, because they went through fire. Mm -hmm. Just like Job, the Jacob's trouble, the hundred forever thousand, going through fire. The many and the few. Mm -hmm. The many and the few. Remember, tomorrow we're going to go more into, you know, what is God expecting, and then we'll have the third one the next day. Let us strive with all the power that God has given us to be among the hundred forty thousand. Mm -hmm. Strive. Strive. Mm -hmm. So it's not well. If I get there, I get there. That's not striving. Mm -hmm. I have to, with all my power, get there to be among the hundred forty thousand. In other words, if I don't strive, I'm short of God's standard. And I don't want to know what happened if I'm short of God's standard. I want to be there. Now let's continue on. Speaking about strive, right? Strive to enter in at the straight gate for many seek to enter and shall not be able. So many will try to enter, but not able. Okay? So if many cannot, how many enter? Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which lead into life and few there we find it. That means only a few. And a few is only a remnant. We few is a remnant. So, as we see that only a few, not many, this is my other confirmation. The number, the church members is growing. Mm -hmm. Growing. Yeah. Rapidly. Mm -hmm. In other words, they are becoming many, many men. And yet, God only needs few. Mm -hmm. That shows that, man, we can go in the wrong direction. If it's only a few, why are you getting so many people? Man, unbelievable. We shall not gain the victory through numbers. There it is. We shall not gain the victory through numbers, but through the full surrender of the souls to Jesus. We are to go forward in His strength, trusting in the mighty God of Israel. There is, there is a lesson for us in the story of Gideon's army. There it is. The 10,000 men which, who chose to follow Gideon were a small... So 10,000 was small. Mm -hmm. Small company compared with the vast and powerful army they were to meet. But the Lord would not work with them, for their trust was altogether too much in their own strength and skill. Gideon was astonished when the Lord said his army was still too large. Like, are you yeah. kidding? <laughs> too large? Man, when they came to a stream, the Lord singled out 300 who in their haste caught up water in their hands as those through whom he would deliver Israel. While those who felt that they were, there was time to get down on their knees to drink could return to their homes. What is this called? So when you get water like this, versus like this. One like this, one like this. What's the difference? One, one has to give, uh, one has to reach for themselves. Okay, one like this, right? So what happened with your head? You still looking around? Still Enemy? Yeah. If you're like this, what do you see? You're helpless. <laughs> you're gonna be beheaded by the enemy like that. Yeah. <laughs> so what is this? So what is this then? In a presumption. Of presumption. Because I expect God to protect me. Oh. When I'm like this, this is I I believe God's gonna protect me, but I don't presume anything. Mm. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. That means I'm a seven day Adventist already. Uh, yeah. That's sin of presumption. Mm -hmm. That's right. yeah. I'm saying. Right? I'm saying. I'm the seed of Abraham. I'm seed of Abraham. God chose us already. Sin of presumption. Instead of 
Watch and pray. Satan is roaring lion. I am a chosen generation. That's it. That's the sin of his own. And guess what? He says what? Those he would deliver as hell. While those who felt that they there was time to get down on their knees to drink could return their home. You know, I don't need you. Go home. I'm not going to send you the gospel. Go home. Go home. Because you have no message. Through this little handful of tried, remember tried fire? There it is. Men the Lord wrought for his people. And their enemies, who were as grasshoppers for a multitude, were utterly defeated and destroyed by a little handful of tried men. Does God need a lot of people? Not at all. He doesn't need any. As a matter of fact, he doesn't need us. But Satan said, We cannot keep, so he's going to use us to answer Satan. Not us, but him. We are totally surrendered to him. It's not about numbers. So when I see the numbers continue to grow, I said, you're going the wrong direction. Wrong direction. With the, just like Mrs. White saw in a vision, that train going to speed lightning, mm -hmm. wrong to perdition. That's where I see it going. The Lord will work with humble men who reveal that they are ever learning, ever under the control of the Holy Spirit. Such men are not of the class represented as ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. True learners of Christ Jesus learn to a purpose. Becoming more, what is our purpose? Becoming more and more Christ-like in word. That's the purpose of Seventh-day Adventist. To become more and more Christ like in word and action. And go back here again. Christ is waiting. He's just waiting for his church that his character shall be pre produced perfectly. And we continue on. For all who profess his name, bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of gospel. Here it is. That means I must produce fruit. And in Genesis, what is in the fruit? Seed. And what do I do with the seed that I produce? I sow the seed to the world. And then the world will produce fruit. So can I give the world something else other than the seed because I don't have the fruit? So why do I have, what do I give the world when I myself don't have the fruit? See, here's the, this is the sequence. I bear fruit and I have the seed now because I have fruit. And that seed I sow so that I will have the world to have fruit. So how can I go to the world when I don't even have fruit? And if I don't have fruit, what seed do I have to give the world? And if I don't give seed, what do I expect them the same, to have? The same fruit. The same fruit. The same fruit. The same fruit. <laughs> so who needs to have the fruit first? His people. And what is his fruit? His perfectly character. So if the fruit is Christ's perfect character, if we continue to expect the majority to hasten Christ's coming, we're going to go in our grave still hoping for Christ's coming. Because they don't believe his fruit anymore. They don't believe that they can produce fruit. And if they don't believe they can produce fruit, what seed are they going to sow to the world? Mm -hmm. Nothing. No wonder we, we got to hasten this, whether they like it or not, because we know they're, they're going the wrong direction. Christ would come to gather the precious grain. We bear fruit. We give the fruit, the seed to them. They bear fruit. Then Christ comes. That means me and then that. God's church and then the world. And this is the little uh, summary. Those who profess bear fruit. And then the world will be sown with the seed of the gospel. And then the last great harvest will be ripened. Then Christ would come. And then the great controversy. And as the gospel order. Okay? As closing. The very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The image. And the image is the perfect character. The honor of God the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. Who's his people? 
Seventh-day Adventists. And the only way we can give honor to God. This one? Okay, yeah. So, first we have to bear fruit. So if we bear fruit, what do we need? Latter rain. Mm -hmm. So once we receive latter rain, we bear fruit. Then we can give the fruit to them and give them the latter rain to ripen their fruit. And then God will harvest the last great harvest. And then Christ will come. But first, we don't have fruit because we reject the latter rain. But we got all the gospel messages to the world. And yet we don't even have fruit. Now you know why we're still here. You know why we're here. We are waiting for we don't know what and when. So we're here waiting for Christ to come when we're doing nothing to hasten his coming. Nothing. I wonder. God is giving it. Even Christ said, you know what? I'm tired of waiting too. So you, you need to get the message. And when we get the message, they start attacking the message. So we know it's the truth. We know we're living in the very last days. The only God and Christ be honored if his people are perfect as even as Christ is also perfect. And that's the people that he produced in 1844 to produce the perfection of his people. And then when he produced that people, he will come. But it's going to be from the same day until. That means it cannot be from the world because God chose us. That means it has to be the remnant the leftover of those who maintain the doctrine of fundamental belief of Adventism. Not the one who already you know, signed up. That's it. That's it. That's it. So tomorrow we continue on part two. Tomorrow a little bit more. And we're going to see more about what God is expecting from under Kirk Downer, which is a bad thing. And then we'll close uh, uh, by on this subject. Okay. So any additional or any